So tonight's theme is marriage. So we're going to do the role of a husband in our first 45 minutes and the role of a wife in the second 45. So I have handouts on the role of the wife. We'll give those to the ladies. Um, so really we're just, that's why I was just, you know, if you're here with your spouse, you can share. So uh, unless we need to make more copies. So we'll talk. Guys, don't make your wife fill out the handout for the role of the husband. <laughs> so, I can. You can have her do that if she wants to do that. So. <laughs> and then, and then, bonus. If you are very well, I'll talk to you. All right, let's open the word of prayer, and then we'll get started tonight. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the BPF, so I pray to be with our kids, so I pray they're having a great time. Thank you for all the workers who are working with them tonight, and uh, God, we just pray that you would uh, just allow this to be a great time of encouragement for all of our children, and uh, Lord, thank you for all the folks who are here tonight. Pray you give us a, a great time as we look at this topic of marriage, and uh, Lord, I pray you'd help us to be better husbands and better wives, and uh, Lord, that we'd have a clear understanding of what your word says on this topic, and Lord, I just pray that you would... Uh, just really encourage us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, I'd like you to start in Ecclesiastes. If you would take your Bible on Ecclesiastes chapter 7. I was reading this in my devotions this morning. Seven verse twenty, the Bible says, "For there is not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin." When you talk about marriage, I would be pretty shocked if you sit here tonight and go, "Man, there was nothing that I need to work on." And I also don't think that you can fix all your marriage issues in a forty-five minute session. And so, but I do want to give her. I did a lot of marriage counseling. I was a pastor up in Canada, all first generation Christians. And the plus of that is they easily came for help. And uh, most of them got saved later in life. Most of them got saved in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. And really had never, some of them grew up in Christian homes, never really had anyone take them through the Bible. And uh, I am a guest speaker, so I don't know who the visitors are tonight and who's normally from the church. I just always say never base your decision in the church on a guest speaker, all right? Come back and hear Pastor Dave. He's, he's excellent. And if you're visiting, you need to come and hear him on Sunday. Um, but I will say that I'm coming from the perspective that this is God's word. And I think that everything in here is true. And I think I like this because it's not a Baptist book, Lutheran book, Catholic book. It's just God's word. Yeah. And so uh, we're going to probably step on some toes. Mm -hmm. We're going to go a little counter culture because I think if you, as you probably are aware, our culture is not really following biblical values. And so uh, I always tell people, bring a Bible and check me out. Make sure I'm telling you the truth. Let it take it for granted. And, uh, and I'm around this week. If you have questions or uh, afterwards or you say, I, I, don't, I didn't see that or I didn't get that, well, you know, it's okay. That, you know, let's take a look at it. But uh, I do hope to be clear enough according to Scripture that if you wrestle, that you wrestle with God's Word, not with me. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully you walk out and say, he did kind of prove that from the Bible. That is at least what the Bible says. The issue is, will you believe it, right? You know, there's, when I was a kid, there was a popular song that said, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it for me. Except it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not, right? Really, the song should say, God said it, and that settles it. And uh, so as we look at what God says about a husband and a wife, um, I do want to do it from Scripture. And I uh, hope to be helpful. I'll use illustrations that come from a lot of marriage counseling. And I would encourage you not to uh, elbow your husband or your wife. Uh, <laughs> let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and hopefully that we can enjoy this time together. I would say I find my life so busy that when I can finally slow down and take a look at being a husband, it's a good thing for me. And it's always a reminder. Uh, I think I said Sunday morning, if I know the message is being a husband or in prayer, I don't have to hear the sermon. I already know I need to go and repent. There's something I can do better. And I would imagine if you're the average couple, there's something you can do better. And probably we'll talk about it tonight. And I would just say, be gracious with your spouse and let God work in his heart, not you. All right? So 
Uh, as we go, there's three roles for a husband and three roles of a wife. I would challenge you, you will never have a marriage problem without a role problem. If there's a problem in your marriage, there's also a role problem. It always, this is always going to be the case. There's lots of things we could cover. We might cover communication later on, but that's a big issue. Communication is a big issue. I think we've, if you've been married longer than a week, you found out that there's a big difference between men and women, right? And so uh, the way they look at things and the way we look at things is very different. So we'll see how we go. Tomorrow night I want to look at parenting, and I hope that will be a help as well. So let's begin with the role of a husband. If you have your handouts, uh, if you get lost, or uh, we can fill in the blanks later. Don't get frustrated. Uh, but we're going to go kind of fast tonight. So let's start with 1 Peter chapter 3. Go up to the 1 Peter chapter 3. The first role of a husband is he is to be a learner. First Peter chapter 3, look what he says in verse 7. Husbands, likewise dwell with them, speaking of their wife. Husbands, likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. We have a note uh, for the husband. Uh, yeah. So, A there, it's a command. Uh, God's commanding us to be a learner. Uh, next in your blanks there, if you're a blank filler, by the way, you don't have to fill the blanks out if you don't want to. Uh, but if you do like to, number one there, it's a command that takes time. And it's a command that takes study. The world says you can't understand women. I would say that's true of women in general. Praise God, you don't have to figure one out if you're married. So, uh, you don't have to figure all the women in the world, you have to figure one out if you're married. And uh, I think if you are opening your Bible, you would agree this is a command. This isn't a suggestion. This isn't good advice. God's saying, husbands, you must dwell with your wife according to knowledge, giving honor to her as the weaker vessel. And he's very clear at the end of that verse, if you don't do that, your prayer life is hindered. So it's a big deal to God that we dwell with our wife according to knowledge. Um, and if I, I have a, something that can get you in trouble, but it's super fun and helpful if you're willing to do it. 50 questions to ask your wife. Most guys don't get 15 out of 50. Uh, you can see if you're above or below average. Uh, there's easy things on here. It's a pretty comprehensive list. There'll be uh, questions about intimacy, uh, what she fear, uh, her favorite restaurant. There's easy stuff, hard stuff. Uh, but if she answers all 50 questions, uh, you'll know her better than her mom. And, uh, and you really should know her that good. But I always say I don't hand this out because I only want you to take it if you're going to do it. It hurts a wife if she knows you have it and you're not doing it. All right? So, um, and you don't have to do it. And it's just a tool. Uh, but it's a really good tool. And so, and what I encourage you is if you're willing to do it, uh, do it when they're not interrupted. So if you have little kids at home, do it after they're in bed. Um, and write her answers down. Don't trust it to memory. You got 50 things here. Uh, and once, you, once she tells you these things, act on them. It's going to hurt her if she opens up and tells you the answer to these 50 things and you don't do anything with it. That's going to be more hurtful to her. And uh, again, I can't tell you how many couples came in my office and the wife says, I don't feel loved. And he says, well, I love her. Well, there was a big problem. There's somewhere along the line there was a disconnect. And often it's in this area that we're not dwelling with our wife according to knowledge. Someone a wife can often surprise her husband on their anniversary by merely mentioning it. <laughs> Have you ever had that happen? It's doubtful that when a girl marries, she planned to give up the attention of several men for the inattention of one. And uh, if you think back to your married life, um, I'm out of handouts. Oh, he needs some more. Good job. <laughs> So, so uh, coming back under B there, it's a command to treat her as fragile. We go to our text, right there in verse 7. Husbands, dwell with your wife with the understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel that you uh, as being heirs, to, heirs together the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. One survey stated the average husband and wife spend 37, 37 minutes a week together in actual communication. You're not going to get to know your wife like that. And often if the kids are small, that's a challenging time. 
you got a lot going on. Uh, by the time you two have time together, you're both exhausted. Um, but God's very clear. You have to take time to know your wife. A Christian husband needs to know his wife's moods, feelings, needs, fears, dreams, which is where 50 questions will really help you. You can't show consideration if you don't understand her needs or her problems. And I think there has to be an openness to discuss everything in marriage. Uh, often when you get married, you have that first fight. If you don't work through it, you lock that door. And you both know we can't go in there, we're going to fight. And if you're not careful, you over time have locked all the doors and the only place you can go is the hallways. And, and so it's a painful thing if you've done that because now you both know we got issues here, but we do need to work it out. By the way, I'll say this tomorrow night on parenting. How often do you think that parents both agree on how to do discipline in the home? Rarely, in my experience. That's why it's nice to have the Bible, right? So, okay, we both have a different attitude. We both grew up differently. How are we going to sort out the right way to do this? So we'll talk about that tomorrow night. But thankfully, God has some things that he's very clear on, on being a husband. He says, guys, you have to dwell with your according to knowledge. I said this when I preached on this on Sunday morning. You walk in and your wife is crying. You say, what's the matter? And she cries harder and says, you should know. She's right. You should know. But often we don't. But that's a clue to tell you, okay, I have, I've been missing some clues here. Because if she thinks I should know, she's right. I should know. And so, but ladies, let me tell you, you getting stubborn about it is not helping us, right? If we miss it the first time, we're not getting it the second time. And so many wives get all stubborn and say, I'm not telling you. You should have figured it out. We can wrap ourselves in tinfoil and try and find a signal in the home. That is not going to help us, all right? So uh, you're, going to have to, you're going to have to help us if we missed it. But it should be a clue. Guys, has this ever happened? You're taking your wife out for dinner. She's shocked. She's finally on a date with you, and it's not Christmas. It's not a, her birthday or your anniversary. And then she makes this statement. What did I just say? When I was newly married, I guessed. <laughs> That is the wrong thing to do. Because <laughs> if she says, what did I just say? What does she already know? You're not you are not paying attention. And she is not sitting there going, man, you're in a completely different planet. What a nice evening this is. I'm having so much fun. You know, earth to gym, are you around anywhere? And, and so again, when your wife says, what did I just say? What does that tell you? You're not dwelling with her according to knowledge. Uh, on intimacy, this is nice we can talk, just, I'm not going to go a lot of this, but God meant holding hands to lead to hugging, to lead to kissing, to lead to long kissing, to lead to necking and petting, to lead to sex. That's God's plan. I fight with college students not to have sex until they get married, because God says they're not to do that. Then I fight with married people to have sex after they're married. That seems weird to me. <laughs> and guys, one of the problems is you're not a learner. I've had, I've had guys come and say she's not interested in sex. I doubt that's true. She might not be interested in you. And this is what happens after we've been married a long time. Guys skip all of that and just want sex. Well, God says, no, all of that is what gets a woman ready to have sex. Think of women as a, as a crock pot. Men are microwaves. They get turned on like that. It takes a while for them. <laughs> and women are turned on by touch and sound. Guys, how romantic have you been? You were romantic when you dated her, or else she wouldn't have married you. How romantic have you been? And I already told you, if you were here on Sunday, five years in our marriage, she put a letter I'd written to her. Hey, that's really good. I haven't had one like that in a while. When's the last time it wasn't her birthday, your anniversary, and you just wrote a love letter to her, a passionate one? You know, and, and women, you know, you say, I love you. Women want to know, well, what specifically do you love about me? And guys, you did that when you were dating. And God says, guys, you've got to dwell with the recorded knowledge. And, and I just think there's a lot of things that, that fall into place here. And guys, you start dwelling with the recorded knowledge. By the way, guys, you take her out on a nice date, have a great time. Guy, a married couple, guy expects to have sex that night. And a woman's okay having sex because she had a nice date. And this is where you got to understand, hey, these things work together. And God says you've got to dwell with their according to knowledge. And again, we'll get to this in a minute when we talk about submission. But I've had some guys who want to throw that verse at their wife 
without dwelling with her according to knowledge and without loving her. And I, I, I that's in our church. I said, we need to wrap those guys up in a carpet, beat the snot out of them, and run away, right? That's, you don't go home and say, woman, submit. That's wrong. No, you dwell with her according to knowledge. And I didn't put this in the Bible. God did. That's why I hope you have one open. It's very clear. Husbands, dwell with them with an understanding, giving honor to the wife. What does it mean, honor? It comes from a Greek word which means high public esteem, high respect. Peter is not saying that a wife is a weaker vessel mentally, morally, or spiritually, simply physically. By the way, this is why you're seeing all these uh, women's sports banning transgender athletes. Because there is a physical difference. And so when guys say they're girls and want to compete in girls' sports, they have an advantage. Why? Because physically, generally, they're going to be stronger. That's the only where he's saying when he says they are the weaker vessel. They're not weaker mentally. Now, by the way, I've sparred with my wife <laughs> mentally. I, I hate playing word games with my wife. She crushes me on those, right? Yeah, she's not weaker mentally. They're not weaker spiritually. It's generally physically. That's what he's talking about here. So since your wife is generally weaker than you physically, you need to be, you need to give her honor, courteous, and thoughtful. Usually happens during dating and engagement. It should happen, it certainly should happen while you're dating and engaged. I tell college students that it's not happening then. It's not going to happen later. If you're not getting treated really well before you get married, don't think that marriage is going to change that. And by the way, I, I don't know everyone's history. I talked to one couple, I don't want to pick you guys out, but I talked to one couple saying we became believers fairly early. But in my church, everyone gets getting saved in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. You know where most, most of them met? Most of them, if you're getting saved in your 20s, 30s, and 40s, you did not meet at church, right? Where did most of the people in our church meet? Bar. Most of us met in a bar, right? And so they come and they say, Pastor Jim, we did everything wrong. <laughs> like, all the reasons we got married were wrong. Like, we didn't have any... You know, now that we know what the Bible says, we, we were doing it wrong. The good news is God put it in the Bible so you can change. Not change spouses. And I've had some people come and say, well, we, we did everything wrong, so we just need to split up and go, no. No, God says I put it in the Bible so you can change to be what God wants you to be. So don't get discouraged if you met in the wrong place. Some guys have got to go pregnant and marry her, and it's okay. God can teach you. You can become a good husband and you can become a good wife if you do it this way. And guys, you can learn about it, but you need to give her honor according to the text. Many husbands forget that happiness is in the home is made up of many little things, including the small courtesies of life. Be open. Big resentments often grow out of small hurts. Seek forgiveness and healing. Giving honor doesn't mean giving in. Giving honor means the husband respects his wife's feelings, thinking, and desires. Husbands should be the thermostat, setting the emotional and spiritual temperature. As someone said, a happy home is one in which each spouse entertains the possibility that the other may be right, though neither believes it. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great statement. They entertain the possibility that they may be right. I don't believe it, but it may be true. The husband who boasts that he never made a mistake has a wife who did. That's a good statement. The husband who boasts he's never made a mistake has a wife who did. And guys, God's very clear in this. It's a command of traitors for to see. It's learning that affects your spiritual life. So if you don't dwell with your wife according to knowledge, if you take the 50-question test and you, you do worse than 15 out of 50, hopefully that's a wake-up call to you to say, hey, i got to work on this. Uh, i got to dwell with her according to knowledge. And like I said on Sunday morning, her answers are going to change. Uh, so every three to five years, your grants are going to change. Keep up. You keep up with technology. Most of us don't have a 20-year-old laptop. We don't have a 20-year-old cell phone. And you got to keep up. What your wife was like when uh, she first married you has probably changed over time. So keep up. Number two, love her. Ephesians 5, verse 25. Love Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wife just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing water by the word, that he may present her to himself a glorious church, not in spot or rank or any such thing. They should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. 
God gives two examples here to husbands. Husbands, love your wife like Christ loves the church, and love your wife like you love your own body. Biblical love is giving. It's your blank. Biblical love is giving. John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave. Ultimate love is giving. There's three Greek words. When you see the word love translated into your Bible, there's three Greek words. Phileo, where we get brotherly love. Eros, where we get erotic love, which there should be some of that in marriage. But agape is the, is the Greek word God uses here. Husbands, agape your wife. Sacrificially love your wife. And so if we're to love her the way God loves the church, this is how I come up with this list under C. So what degrees are you going to show love? Number one, first. First John 4, 19, we love him because he what? First loved us. So the husband is to love his wife how? Please talk back to me. We're supposed to love our wife how? Okay, but in the text, first, right? We're to love her first. So if you have a marriage problem, who is supposed to go first? If the husband is supposed to love his wife first, who has to go first? Husband. Husband, right? You know what happens in marriage problems? Everyone's willing to work on their marriage if the spouse does. So what do you do when both are waiting for the other one to go first? Well, thankfully the Bible is very clear who's supposed to go first. I help this with couples because I say in marriage counseling, the most mature one goes first. Everyone wants to be mature, right? <laughs> so all of a sudden they say, okay, I'll work on it first. <laughs> but, biblically speaking, God's very clear. Husbands, you don't love your wife. Christ. You love her like Christ loves the church. God loves us first. Aren't you glad God loves us first? Mm -hmm. And so husbands, you need to be working first. By the way, I've worked with a lot of couples. You give them a book on marriage, who will read it first, husband or wife? Wife. wife? wife, almost all the time. Who will recognize the problem in the marriage first, husband or wife? wife. Almost always the wife. But who is supposed to have it first? Husband. Both biblically, it's supposed to be the husband. All right? Number two, most. God's very clear. No one loves the church more than he does. And you're to love your wife most. I would challenge you that there shouldn't be anyone, including the kids, that love your wife more than you do. Whenever I see moms holding 11-year-olds in their lap, it's usually an indication they're not getting love from dad. And they're trying to get all that love from the kids. And God's very clear. No one on planet Earth should love your wife more than you do if you're married. You should love her most. Number three, sacrificially. Ephesians 5.25. We're right here. Husbands, love your wife just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. How much did God do for the church? He died. He died. You know what I hear guys tell me? Dr. Jim. Well, they called him Pastor Jim back then. Pastor Jim. If i got to do all this, it's going to kill me. I says, well, until it does, you need to do it. <laughs> and I didn't say that the Bible says that. Husbands, love your wife like who? Like Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. And if you were not here on Sunday morning, I talked about how weird that guys would say, if someone breaks in my home, I'm going to kill him. I meant it's him or me. I'd lay down my life for my wife or my kids. And that's how it should be, guys. Say, man, I, and I have weapons in my home. I have home court advantage, right? God would be foolish to break in my home because he will not walk out alive. But how often is that really going to happen to any of us? But then our wife says, hey, can you take out the trash? Right now? <laughs> I mean, the game's not. Come on. <laughs> you know, like I said, the bulb goes out in the refrigerator. Hey, can you put a new bulb in? Sure. She learns Braille before you put a new light bulb in there, right? You can reach in and change it and get anything in the dark. And guys, we need to understand that we need to do those daily sacrifices. Just like Christ sacrificed for us. And if we say we make the ultimate sacrifice, but we won't make the daily sacrifices... That's weird. Number three, uh, number four, unmistakably. First John 3, 18, God loves us unmistakably. I believe this should be unmistakable to two people. It should be unmistakable to your wife. I would challenge you in the privacy of your own home when it's just you and your spouse, look her in the eye and ask her this question. Do you feel loved by me? If she tears up, if she doesn't answer, that is an answer. And guys, what you want to get to the point is you can look her in the eye when it's just the two of you and just say, do you feel loved by me? And have her look right you in the eye and say, absolutely. It needs to be unmistakable. I can't tell you how many times women come in my office and say, I don't feel loved. Every guy says, I love her. Well, that's a problem. 
And secondly, it should be unmistakable to everybody else. Have you ever been at a restaurant and seen a couple fight? Like, that's like cheap entertainment for me. I just can't, I'm kind of twisted that way. Like, I just can't stop watching that. You know, I just like, and then I look at them over there, like, they're, they're going at it. And you're like, seriously, you're on a date and you guys are having a battle royale at a restaurant? But then have you ever been around those other couples and you just, the way they look at each other? You see those old couples, they walk out ahead of you, they don't know you're watching, and they're holding hands as they walk out. And you just, you just spend time around them, and you're just like, oh, man, get a room. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? That's unmistakable. That's the kind of love we should have for our spouse. If my wife was here, if you spent an hour or two with us, you should be able to say, I think he likes her. <laughs> Are you tracking with me? By the way, can't we pretty much tell that? You spend enough time with people, you can kind of tell who likes being with each other and who's putting up with each other. And God says it should be unmistakable to everybody else. Someone said, if you open the car door for your wife, either the wife or the car is new. I don't know if it needs to be like that, all right? Guys, we may have to warm up the car before she gets in instead of before she gets out. You know what I'm talking about? Just jump in the car cold and it'll be warm by the time we get there. Remember when you were dating, you warmed it up first? And let me encourage you. Is it unmistakable? Number five, in spite of her faults. Look at Romans 5, verse 8. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, everyone is going to have a fault. I, I, read, I was had my devotions in Ecclesiastes, and I read that verse that I read to you, Ecclesiastes 7.20. That's Solomon, I believe, right? Ecclesiastes, the wisest man say, there's no righteous person who is not a sinner. You know what happens when we get irritated with our wife is every wife in this room has some problems. Just like every guy in this room has some problems. And when you were getting engaged and when you got married, you overlooked those problems because you thought she was awesome. And I'm always in the back with the guys, and I've asked this every wedding I've ever done. I say, are you sure you want to go through with this? <coughs> Thankfully, the boss said yes. I don't know what I'd say if they said no. <laughs> Absolutely. They get a goofy grin on their face. Girls coming out of the aisle, she got a goofy grin on her face. You know what he's saying? I'm giving up every woman on the planet to get her, and I'm getting a good deal. Man, that is awesome. I'm happy to do it. Man, what a blessing. And yet, over time, all those faults that she's had all the way along start becoming all you see. And you lock in on those problems, and that's all you see is those problems. And now you're ignoring all of her good points, which every woman in this room also has. And it's a huge mistake to think if she wasn't in my life, my life would be better. Probably not. And the Bible says, if you're gonna, aren't you glad that God loves us in spite of our faults? That, as it says here, he loved us while we were sinners. And I'm so glad God doesn't say, Jim, when you're perfect, I'll love you. No, God said, Jim, you're a sinner. But boy, I love you. And husbands, if we're to love our wife like Christ loves the church, then we have to love her in spite of her faults. And then number six, we love her without bitterness. Look at Colossians 3.19. Colossians chapter 3, verse 19. Husbands, love your wife, but do not be bitter toward them. Bitterness is harbored hurt. And I would just encourage you, why does God put this in the Bible and there's not a verse like this to wives? Because guys, it must be that we can hold a grudge better than our wives do. And God says you must love your wife. Again, I hope you have a Bible. I am not saying this. That I'm reading the Bible to you tonight. The Bible says, husbands, love your wife and be not bitter against them. And guys, if you're holding a grudge, and I would just challenge you, this is a problem for husbands. And, if, if, and you have a wife who's not perfect. That's why we all have to forgive. By the way, she has to forgive you. And it's as easy when my wife isn't here, but... Um, 
I have an awesome life. Farm, we're both farm kids, both hardworking. My wife is type A and I'm type A, so you can imagine the fireworks we had when we first got married, right? Uh, we're sorting out our marriage and we're both, I mean, you play us in games, we play to win. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and and uh, now we still love each other when it's over, but I mean, we are going for the throat. I mean, and this, we're, we're all in. And uh, we had sold our home and uh, we bought another home. It was my wife's dream home two years before we moved to Faith. It didn't have a dishwasher, so I'm going to wire in a dishwasher. And uh, we're renting out our old home. So we got everything set up. The old home has to be cleaned out, everything cleaned up. And then I got to get the dishwasher and we're ready to move in on the next day. Everything's moved out. We've both been working long days, <coughs> long nights, getting this all ready. And then I go to church that day and I'm planning to leave at five to wire in the dishwasher. Everything's be fine. Four o'clock on that day, I get a call from a deacon's wife and her husband in one night did every sin you could possibly do in one night. And he told her he's leaving her. And I did not see this coming. And obviously this guy had a lot of hidden stuff. And so I, I said, well, where is he? She said, I have no idea. I had his phone number, so I called him and picked up the phone. I said, where in the world are you? If you're in Canada, you gotta go to Tim Hortons. I mean, that's just where you meet. And so I said, meet me at Tim Hortons. So we meet at Tim Hortons, long, long conversation. Finally, talk him off the ledge. You get him to go home. Go over and meet with him and his wife. Get him at least to, he's okay for tonight. But now it's 10 o'clock at night. I still have to wire in the dishwasher. So I go over to our new place. I wire in the dishwasher. I go over to the old place to make sure everything's okay. Now it's probably about 1 in the morning. And I walk in, and I walk in the basement, and there's a little pile of garbage that's probably maybe that big. And I lose my mind. You know what I'm thinking? I'm working my guts out here and she couldn't pick that little pile of garbage up. Are you kidding me? Like, what in the world? Like, doesn't she care? Like, are, are we a team? I'm thinking all these thoughts, right? I mean, I am smoked. I go home. I am, she's asleep. I am still smoked. I'm so smoked. I woke her up at 2.30 to tell her how smoked I was. <laughs> and then I went back to sleep. <laughs> And I went to work the next day, and I was still irritated. And I called a really good friend, pastor friend, and you go, we all need guys like this. So I called him up. I told him what I, I'd done and what had happened. He said, you are an idiot. <laughs> he said, she is a country girl. You know how hard she works? He says, you need to go home right now, crawl up on your knees, and beg her to forgive you. I was like, oh, John, he's right. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. I went home. I didn't go on my knees. But I walked in the door, and I said, honey, I am sorry. I was an idiot. That was totally wrong. Will you please forgive me? And I have a gracious wife that she forgave me. But do you know how many guys carry bitterness over something that stupid longer than I did? I was wrong. She is a hard worker. She was working just as hard as I was. It wasn't her fault that a deacon went off the rails that night. And guys, we hold those little things and we hang on to them and we hold them over our head and we remind her of them. And God says, if you have your Bible, we are not to do that. And again, she could probably bring up all of your faults and hold those over your head. Um, my mom, when my mom and dad first got married, had a Volkswagen bug, drove it when the oil light came on and kept driving. <laughs> Burned up the engine. So what would my dad tend to bring up every now and then? <laughs> but when my mom's not laughing, we shouldn't bring it up anymore, right? Are you shocking with me? And this is where you say, guys, we need to dwell with our wife in knowledge and we're to love her in all of these ways. Let me ask you tonight, again, don't nudge your husband, but husbands, would you say tonight, I love my wife first, I love her most, I love her sacrificially, I love her unmistakably, I love her in spite of her faults. I love her without bitterness. And if I looked her in the eye in private, I'm confident she'd look me right back in the eye and say, absolutely, I know you love me. And that has not always been the case with Joan and I. But the Bible says this is what it's supposed to look like. And, and again, because we're not perfect, this is, the goal here is not to beat yourself up. We're all sinners. The goal is to improve. Because like, some, some guys look at this list and say, oh, I'll never do that, so they don't even try anything. 
Maybe just pick one of these and say, hey, I just want to work on one of these things. Maybe you want to write a love letter this week. How long has that been? And just say, man, I, maybe if you, if you just can't, go to, go to Hallmark, find one, all right? Just sign your name and say, I mean everything on this card. I wish I had thought of myself. I'm not that creative, but everything on this card, I mean every word of it. Put an exclamation point and sign your name at the bottom, all right? So help yourself out. All right, leader. A, if you're blank there. What leadership is not is your first blank. What leadership is not. It is not a dictator. The theme of servant, came down your notes, the theme of servant is applied to leadership. The world's definition of leadership is how many serve you as the blank. So in other words, if uh, you are a business owner, I come up to you and say, hey, how many people work for you? And you said, well, I have 100 people working for me. And I think, wow, you must be good. But if you talk to those 100 people and go, he's a jerk. <laughs> you realize that just because you have a bunch of people working under you doesn't make you a good leader? Not to go into politics, mm -hmm. but we won't go there right now. But positions don't make you a great leader, right? That's right. And I'm a pastor. I'm a college president. I don't get it right all the time. And so leadership is not how many serve you. Christ's definition of leadership is how many you serve as the blame. There's a great debate among the disciples. Who's going to be the greatest in heaven? <laughs> Can we sit on the right-hand side? Can we sort that out right now? I want to know who's the greatest in heaven. And Jesus says, let me help you. Whoever's going to be the greatest, let him be servant of all. If you're going to be great, serve. If we ask the kids, now they're all at BBS right now, so we don't get to ask them, but if we ask the average kid, who's the greatest servant in the home, mom or dad, what will most kids tell you? Mom. 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 What does the Bible say they should say? Dad. Dad. Mm -hmm. Ouch, right? Mm -hmm. The Bible says it should be dad. Leadership is serving. If I use the pyramid, leadership, you have two ideas of leadership. <laughs> this I'm at the top and everyone there is there to serve me, or this. I'm at the bottom, I'm supporting everyone outside. This kind of a leader understands their responsibility. This kind of leader says, I am responsible for my wife and my kids. Not, they're here to serve me. I don't come home and say, honey, get my slippers, I uh, hope the food's ready, you know what I mean, I hope everything's perfect. No, that's the wrong kind of leader. A leader comes home and says, hey, what can I do to help? And again, I've done this a long time. I've had guys that come home, and you know what they say? I've been in a hard day today. <laughs> By the way, give your wife a whole day off, and you take care of the kids all day, and then you'll have a better attitude about that, right? <laughs> Most guys, after one day, are begging their wife to come home. <laughs> are you almost home, honey? <laughs> I'm, about to, I'm about to die here. <laughs> Can you please come home now? And you understand, no, I'm responsible. So when I come home, I need to be willing to say, hey, what can I do to help? Have you ever had guys say, I don't do that? Yeah. Or that's women's work. Yeah. Boy, that's a bad attitude. No, you come home to serve. Hey, what can I do to help? We're going to get to her in a minute, guys. Come back in the second session, right? But we're talking about you right now. You need to be that kind of a leader. Christ's definition of leadership, how many you serve. So what leadership is not, it's not a dictator, it's not number two, all the decision making. One of the roles that God's given your wife is a help me. She can't fulfill her role if you won't let her make some decisions. I've met with guys who do grocery shopping. And that's so crazy. I mean, if she doesn't, as long as the bedroom's not pink, right? Let her paint it how she wants to paint it. Let her move the furniture around. Let her move the furniture around. I mean, that, you're to work as a team. And when you have to make every single little decision, you're hindering the team. Mm -hmm. Just like if I did that at, at the college. If everything at the college had to be run by me, it hindered the college. I got to give people, I put people who have good, re good skill sets and I turn them loose. And if we end up having a problem, I'll take responsibility for it, right? Because I'm a leader. But offline, I'll go to them and say, hey, we can't have that happen again. <clears throat> But the leader says, hey, I'm not making all the decisions here. I'm going to set the chart. We're going to head this direction. But I'm going to give her some freedom to make the decisions. So flip yours over for those of you who thought that was it. Uh, what leadership is. We've looked at what it's not. It's not a dictator. 
It's not making either decision. It's a pace setter. Be a shepherd, not a cowboy. Lead your wife, don't drive your wife. Cowboys drive the herd, right? They're behind the cows. They try to push them. A shepherd is out in front and the sheep follow them. By the way, if you think you're leading and you turn around and no one's following you, you're really just going for a walk, all right? <laughs> That's not leadership. Leaders get people who say, I want to follow. I, I want to get behind this. And good leaders work at that. So let's look at this again, all based on the scripture. A good leader focuses on needs. We have all the verses here, so we have like six minutes, so I'm just going to fill in these blanks. Focuses on needs. Number two is goal-oriented. We talked about this yesterday. What's the difference between a desire and a goal? A goal is something that I can achieve. A desire is something that I cannot achieve. So what is the goals for your family? What are the things you can achieve? Number three, set an example of control. Guys, it is not okay to throw a wrench across the garage. It's not okay to kick the cat. Uh, I had a guy come in, he smashed dishes. And this, this was his comment to me. Well, I didn't touch her. Well, that's really good, sir. You scared her half to death. I mean, I'm really glad you didn't touch her. No, God says you've got to set an example of control. And if you struggle with your temper, if you struggle with anger, I mean, go outside and yell in the woods somewhere. But that is a terrible example to your kids. In fact, the Bible says in Proverbs, make no friendship with the what? Angry man. And so, guys, you've got to set an example. A leader sets an example of control. If Pastor Dave, and I can't even imagine him doing this, but if he had a temper tantrum in the pulpit, <laughs> I mean, like, completely loses it, and let's just pick on Gary, my new best friend here, and, uh, <laughs> and he just rips on Gary, he rips on cows, I mean, he rips on farming, he just rips every, I mean, just shreds Gary in front of the whole church. Most churches would say, he's done. Like, he can't come back and be your pastor next week. You cannot lose your temper like that in the pulpit. And again, I, I can't even imagine Pastor Dave doing that. But we say we get that in that kind of leadership. What about in our homes? And when you yell and scream at your wife and call her names and slam the door, that is unacceptable according to God. God says that is never okay. Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. By the way, the D word should never come out of your mouth. You should never say, I'm thinking of a divorce. No, that's not okay. And this is where you've got to say, no, I've got to set an example of control. Number four, I need to solve problems. Who's the problem solver in the home? By the way, the, the wife will usually let you know where the problems are, especially with the kids. So when your wife comes home and says, honey, Joe, uh, Joe's just my generic name, Joey needs some time with you. If you're a problem solver, what are you going to do? You're going to find time to spend time with Joey. If my wife says there's a problem, then i got to try and work on it. And again, I, I shared this yesterday. It's not okay, but I think we fix plumbing problems faster than we fix our marriage problems. And there is a point where a wife says, I'm done. I told you years ago, you didn't get help, and I, I'm done. You need When you know there's a problem, you need to solve it like you have a leaking faucet, like you have a pipe that exploded in your home. You need to be the problem solver. You need to be a teacher, number five. And again, you have all the scripture here to look this up. Number six, live joyfully. Proverbs 5, 18, the Bible says, live joyfully with the wife of thy youth. It doesn't say live joyfully with the youthful wife, all right? <laughs> live joyfully with the wife of your youth. You shouldn't take your wife to the Christmas party and all the guys you work with come up to your wife and go, your husband is such a riot. He is so much fun. And the wife was going, you've got to be the wrong guy. <laughs> I mean, you, this, it can't be my husband. Like, you, you're talking about this guy right here. This guy's the guy that's Mr. Fun Time at work. God says, guys, do you have fun at home? And, and again, if you lose your love, you're going to get crabby. Those two things go together. Because when you love your wife, you'll work at being fun. And by the way, you got her to marry you because she thought you were fun at one point, right? No woman says, oh, you are so crabby. Can I spend the rest of my life with you? <laughs> you know, there was a point where she thought, hey, you are fun. I like being with you, man. When I'm around you, you make me smile. Man, when I'm around you, you, you just do something to me that just, wow, I just, I love being with you. And yet, if we're not careful, guys, and again, the Bible says, husbands, live joyfully with the wife of you. Be fun at home. 
By the way, be fun in a way that she thinks is fun, right? If she hates tickling, don't tickle her. Um, if, if she is not enjoying a sarcastic sense of humor, don't be sarcastic. I mean, I mean again, it's easy with my wife not here, but I've been playing hockey, so if you know anything about hockey, there's a thing called a hip check. And you can skate by a guy, and you can hit him with your hip. My wife's cool with that, so I'll walk by and I'll hip check her, right? And she'll hip check me back, and, and we're, we'll have fun. We, we have a ton of fun. I rarely laugh harder with anyone I ever know than my wife. And we both have a twisted sense of humor, and we can see something, and we, we can even watch a scenario, and we both think it's funny, and most other people are like, you probably shouldn't laugh about that. <laughs> I'm like, but that is so funny. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh about it, but it's funny. And I'll look at her, and she'll look, have, we, have you ever had just that glance? And sometimes we're okay, except when we do look at each other, and then we can't hold it in, then we're laughing. My shoulders are going up and down. Tears are coming out of my eyes. That's good. It's healthy. Are you still having fun in your marriage? And then sudden spiritual leadership. Guys, it's your responsibility to make sure the family goes to church. It's your responsibility to make sure the family is reading their devotions. It's your responsibility to make sure that things are going well spiritually in the home. Again, who is generally doing this? Generally, the wife. God's very clear. This needs to come from the husband. So we covered a lot of ground in 45 minutes. And uh, I, I gave you the handout. 50 questions are up here if you want to take them. And uh, we're going to take a 15-minute break. And then we'll talk about the wives. So don't go home. <laughs>
the goal, again, goal is something we can accomplish, is wife not only being submissive but comfortable with it because of her husband's leadership. For a wife to be joyful, she must be God's kind of woman. Before we go back to Ephesians, if you're still in 1 Peter, wives be submissive to your own husband if they, some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wife. And uh, ladies, let me just encourage you, you're not your husband's Holy Spirit. And, uh, and if you have an unsaved husband or a husband that's just struggling spiritually, you try to pound on him all the time is not the right approach. And uh, when I went up to Canada, uh, I, had, I had a church of 10 people. I didn't know anybody, so I, I met all the people on my block and on the outside block. And I was coming around the outside block, and uh, this guy was, had the garage door open up and saw me coming. He said to his wife, you go talk to him. And she came down and said, hey, I'm Pastor Jim. I'm a new pastor there. Just and he goes, oh, you're a pastor. He says, come on up. And uh, so he came up. He had a bad Catholic experience. And, and uh, so he had told his wife she could never go to church, meaning a Catholic church. And so as we started talking, he found out as a Baptist. He said, well, you can go to his church. <laughs> and so, but he was a mean drunk. And he would get drunk all the time. And he was so mean, he fixed cars on the side. So I built a friendship with him. I had him work in my car. And uh, we became great friends. They'd have us over for dinner. We'd have him over for dinner. Uh, but he was so mean that if his wife's car had a problem, he would fix her car and charge her to fix it. <laughs> I mean, this is not a good husband, right? This is, this is not a good husband. Don't get any ideas here, guys. <laughs> That's <okay. laughs> And so, um, so we kept witnessing to him, and uh, my wife on my birthday was on a Sunday, and she said, hey, it mean a lot to Jim if you come to church on his birthday, and she came, he came, and I, I didn't know he was coming, I preached on knowing God, he bolted right after the service, and, uh, I, and he had a great sense of humor, and we just did a lot of things together, but every time I gave him the gospel, he would laugh and off, have a joke, well, what, I mean, we had built this relationship, we prayed for him every night, for five years to get saved. Wow. And uh, one day we're talking on the phone, and I don't know what happened, but somehow I brought the gospel again. And this time he got mad. He's like, how come every time we talk, you got to bring up the God? You know, if you can't talk without talking about God, I don't want to talk to you again. Bam, hang up the phone. <laughs> you don't have to know me. I just dialed him right back. <laughs> I said, Reg, next time we'll talk about baseball. We don't have to talk about God all the time. I just care about you. I want you to be in heaven with me. All right, knock it off. By the way, this is a huge dude. Like, he's like 6'3", 300 pounds. This is a gigantic guy. <laughs> Two weeks later, in an absolute blizzard, he calls me up. I need to meet you in your office right now. I said, and he had a great sense of humor. I said, that's really funny, Reg. Yeah. He goes, no, I'm being serious. I said, Reg, you want me to drive through a blizzard, and you're going to be in my office. Is that what you're talking That's what I'm telling I said, Reg, if I drive through Blizzard and you are not there, I will never talk to you again. <laughs> I said, don't be messing with me. Like, this is, I'm not, this is, this is a Blizzard, Reg. Like, I know, I got to talk to you right now. I said, Reg, I'm, I'm t you're telling me I'm going to leave right now and you're going to be at my office when I get there. That's what I'm saying. I said, well, you better be. I'll be there, I'll be there. I drove through an absolute Blizzard. If you haven't been in a Canadian Blizzard, it's a serious deal. I can hardly see up the end of the, my front of my truck. I get to my office and he's there. And I'm like, what is so important? And I walk in my office, he walks in, he says, I need to be saved. Oh, wow. And I'm like, why now? <laughs> <laughs> and this is what he told me. <clears throat> he said, when my wife went to your church, he said, I have been mean and miserable. And she's been nothing but nice and sweet. Mm -hmm. And he said, I can't take it anymore. <laughs> and he said, I have to get saved. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what verse 1 is telling you. <laughs> if they won't listen to the word, they can be won by the lifestyle of the wife. Mm -hmm. And ladies, if you miss anything I say tonight, no matter what your husband says, you influence him. Mm -hmm. If he says to you, I don't care what you think, he is lying. All right? And so he may say, I don't care what you think. He cares what you think. You influence him. And if he won't listen to the word, he's doing things wrong. He's not listening to the preaching on Sunday. He's got all these issues. You harping on him all the time is not the best way to see things come out. 
I say it this way, ladies, duck and let God have it. <coughs> and some ladies are so busy trying to fix their husband, and, they, and most husbands will resent that. Because he doesn't want a mom, he wants a wife. There's a huge difference, by the way. Mm. And when you try and be his mom, and you try and fix everything, and most husbands are going to resent that, but it's amazing when you step out of the way and let God do it, God will do it faster and better than you ever could. And that's kind of this issue, is you've got to trust God in this area of submission. And God says, well, women be submissive, and, and let's look at what it is and what it is not. So let's come down on A there in your blanks. What submission is not? By the way, before I get there, are wives the only ones that have to submit? No. Okay. Are we supposed to all submit to our government? Are we supposed to, I'm not asking if you do, are we supposed to submit to the security sites? Right? We're supposed to, right? Those, those speed limit signs are not suggestions, right? That's the law. Now, your conscience, what you do after that, right? But we all say, no, that's not, and if an officer gives you a speeding ticket, you can't say, well, I thought that was just a suggestion. No, that was the law. You broke the law. And so, it's not just wives. We all have to submit. If you work under someone at work, if, you, if your employer tells you to do something and you tell him, go jump in the lake, you probably don't have a job. <laughs> Why? You have to submit to your boss. So it's not like, sometimes women think we're the only ones that have to submit. No, that's not true. Mm. We have to submit to government, all of us do. We have to submit uh, to our employers those of us that are uh, working under someone, go back if you would to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, before the verses we read, look at verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. In other words, my goal is not always demanding my rights. Give, love is giving. Love is saying how much can I give up. So submission is not just an issue for wives, it's an issue for all of us. But, in, in we, but we specifically here want to look at the area of marriage. Now ladies, again, some of you are just super laid back, that you're just like, this is just not a problem for me. If my sweetheart was here, this would be a problem for her, right? She is a type A, strong personality. And so it was not easy for her. And, and by the way, God is the only one who's perfect. So husbands never forget that. How, how many of us, don't raise your hand, because if you raise your hand, you're wrong. How many of us would say, I always submit to God? Like I just, whatever he says, I always do that. There shouldn't be one hand in this room. So we have a perfect Heavenly Father, and you know what everyone in this room says? We don't submit to him all the time. And so then our, our God says, wives, submit to your husband. Then if we don't submit to a perfect God, might she struggle to maybe an imperfect guy? She might. But someone has to be in charge. If you went to work and there was no boss, it would be absolute chaos at work. If, we, if, if there was no government, it would be absolute chaos in our country. Someone has to be in charge. And so when God designed the family, he says someone has to be in charge. And so God says that needs to be the husband. Now, that's not popular in our culture today, but it is biblical. That's why I hope you've read this in the Bible. God, and this topic can get pretty testy, but that's why I want to say, what does God say? And God would say, if someone's in charge, things work well together. If you think of a husband and wife, think president, vice president. God says in marriage, a husband and wife, when they get married, two are what? One. Two are one. By the way, is there another example of something like that? It's the Trinity. Three are what? Three are one. Is anyone in the Trinity less important? The Holy Spirit is not less than Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is not less than God. They are all equal. So it doesn't mean that one of them is less than. So submission does not mean that a wife is less than. Are you tracking with me right now? Because in the Trinity, one of them is not less than. Three are one, two are one. But, in the Trinity, who is in charge? The Father. The Father, God. We all know that, and that makes sense to us, 
But do any of us think Jesus is less than? No. How grateful are we for Jesus Christ? Do any of us think the Holy Spirit is less than? No. We're thankful for the Holy Spirit. Was it hard for Jesus to follow God the Father? Do you remember a time at the crucifixion where he prays three times? Father, please, is there any other way that Jim Tillotson can go to heaven? And God says, no. If you don't die for them, there's no other way. But this is the plan. And Jesus says, thy will be done. Take your Bible and go over to Philippians chapter 2. You're right here in Ephesians. <clears throat> Philippians 2 verse 1. Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being one accord of one mind. This is how we should treat each other. The Bible is very clear. In a church, we should be like-minded. We should have the same love. We should be of one accord of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than himself. By the way, would you want to be a part of a church like this? I would. And they said, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So what is submission is not? Coming back to your blanks here. Number one, it is not inequality. A wife is not less than a husband. The Bible is very clear. Husband and women are equal. All right? Number two, it is not infallibility of the husband. God doesn't say, submit to your husband because he's always right. That's not, that's not true. But God does say it's how things have to get done. There has to be an order in the home. And because there has to be order in the home, God says the husband needs to be the leader. So submission does not mean your husband's always right. If you've been married more than three weeks, you know that's true. <laughs> All right? Number three, I'm just trying to keep it uh, alliterated, so I put inarticulation or silence. <laughs> Submission does not mean that you don't speak up. So some women kind of get this defeatist attitude about submission, and they just think, well, I'm not going to say anything. Well, one of your other roles we'll get to in a minute is a helper. You need to speak up. So if, if a guy is making a big mistake, you should be telling him that. You say, hey, this is a big mistake. And he may still do it. And you say, and we've been at your in-laws every Christmas for the last 10 Christmases. This is a big mistake. You know, well, we're going to work that through. But you do speak up. It doesn't mean you don't say anything. Submission does not mean, number four, intellectual stagnation. You know, you get some women who hear about a submission and they think, well, I'm just barefoot and pregnant. That's all, I, that's all I can do. No, that's not what the Bible says. It's not intellectual stagnation. By the way, you can think of lots of women in Scripture that were very industrious, mm -hmm. both Old and New Testament. Number five, ingenious manipulation. <laughs> I had a couple come in, and they were having a huge battle in their marriage. And I, I always go over the roles, because if you have a marriage problem, you always have a role problem. And I got the submission that this lady looked at me and said, I always submit to my husband. Just ask him, Pastor. Just ask him. Which I've never had a woman tell me that. Like, you're going to tell me you have always submitted to your husband? And I, and I asked her that. I said, you're telling me you always submitted to your husband? Yes, I have. Just ask him. Just ask him. And I looked at him and said, sir, is that true? Is she? You can't think of one time that she didn't submit? I'm easy to pause because I guess I'd have to say that's true. And I was like, wow, I've never heard that. And he says, well, Pastor Jim, she just starts crying and she's so miserable. I finally just say, oh, all right, we'll do it your way. <laughs> Ladies, that is not submission. That's a genius manipulation. All right? There's a big difference. But ladies, you're not to manipulate your husband. You're to work with him. And so uh, submission is not ingenious manipulation, so you always get your way. Or you make him pay, so you're just like, it's just not worth it anymore. Uh, and then lastly, it's not influence impossible. Uh, 
Let's go, just for a sake of time, let's go to Proverbs 31 in the Old Testament. <laughs> Proverbs 31, look what he says beginning verse 10. Who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts her, so he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax, and willingly works with her hands. She's like the merchant ship. She brings her food from afar. She also rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household, a portion for her maidservant. She considers a field and buys it. From her profit, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength. Strengthens her arm, she perceives that her merchandise is good. Her lamp does not go out by night. She stretches out her hands to the distaff. Her hand holds the spindle. She extends her hand to the poor. She reaches out her hands to the needy. She's not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household is clothed with scarlet. She makes tapestry for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates where he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies sashes for the merchants. Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. She watches over the ways of her household. She does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful. Beauty is passing. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. This is a description of a godly wife, and clearly she's submissive, but she's awesome. So submission means you don't just sit around and do nothing. That's the wrong attitude. It just means just like in the Trinity, God has to be. He's the Father in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Marriage to our one. Husband, wife. President, vice president. But the husband is to have the final say. And that's because God says that's the way things have to get done. And it's one of the curses. And again, we don't have time to flesh all this out. Uh, but when Adam and Eve sinned, uh, the Bible says that Eve was deceived, uh, but not Adam. And a lot of times we give Eve a hard time, but Adam was right there. And so uh, Adam knew what he was doing when he ate. But Eve was deceived. And so one of the curses was that you're going you're, you're gonna to have to be in submission to the husband. The husband is the one who's going to be in charge. And so, uh, what is it then? So we give you a long list of what it's not. What is submission? It means to arrange yourself and rank under. Your first blank there, it's a divine plan for function and order. Just like work would be chaos without someone in charge or government, your home will be in chaos if someone isn't in charge. It's a way of life for all believers. All of us are to submit to God. Go back to Ephesians chapter 5, if you would. <coughs> Ephesians 5.22, the Bible says, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Number three, it's your attitude toward God. Number four, these kind of go together, it's an act of the will. I'm not going to ask about your driving habits, but there may be some of you that never speed. And some of you say, I just, I never speed. But there may be some of you that know some officers and say, well, they say in five over. They're not going to give me a problem with five over, so I'll go five over. Some of you say, I just want to give you on the fastest car and follow them. Or whatever your attitude on speeding is, but you know what the law says. And submission is when you don't agree. I don't want to have to drive 55. I want to drive 75. But submission says, but the law says 55, so I will submit. Uh, you know, if you are in a small town, that's a blessing. You get in a big town, there's a thing called zoning ordinances. There's covenant agreements. There's all kinds of crazy stuff that you're like, I can't do that? Why not? Because there's a covenant that says you can't. Uh, where I live, I can't have a fifth wheel just parked outside. It has to be inside a garage. Mm. I grew up on a farm. We never had to worry about that. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. i got to put up a garage for my fifth wheel that's meant to be outside. Did I get that right? <laughs> and you just, I'm a little rebel. That irritates me, right? Mm. So I sold my fifth wheel. <laughs> I'm not doing that. You know? 
But those are things that come up, right? Where we just say, I disagree. You're going to have things like that often in marriage. A good leader will listen. Guys, you should listen. If you think about all the things you and your spouse have disagreed on over the years, finances, parenting, uh, whose house are we going to for Christmas, whose house are we going to for Thanksgiving, uh, how are we going to spend our investments, uh, what are we going to do? You're going to have those disagreements, and the Bible is very clear that it needs to be at the end of the day the husband's final decision. Because, ladies, this is the good news, he'll answer to God for that. You're off the hook. So you won't answer to God for those decisions. That God didn't look at him. He's responsible. So if he makes a bad decision, you're not responsible for that. He is. That's why, because, if you can put it this way, because the, he's responsible, that gives you a ton of freedom. Now, you should speak up. But an act of the will, because submission, let's be honest, submission's never a problem when you both agree, right? When you both see it the same way, that's not an issue of submission. Submission is when you don't see it the way he sees it. And you're just like, you are nuts. And by the way, I'm sure this has happened. Have you ever put your foot down and said, we're doing it, and then finds out she was right? <clears throat> Ladies, let me tell you, we don't need to hear I told you so. We already know that, all right? And some ladies, man, they just kind of just, I told you we should have done that. Well, honey, obviously we both know that now. That's not helpful in this situation. An act of the will, it's when you disagree that you have to say, okay, I've, I've told him I disagree. I've told him what I thought. And he still says this is what we need to do. That's where God says, now I arrange myself and rank under. I say, okay, I told you I disagree. I told you this is what I think but now I'm going to submit. That's an act of the will. You won't submit without doing that. You're going to have to make a decision. And it's going to, it's going to be hard. Why? Because you disagree. And you know you're right deep down inside. And you have to say, man, I disagree. I know I'm right. But God says you're the leader. All right, it's a proof of love. It's a proof of love. In John 14, 31, by the way, it's a proof of love to God is the point. <laughs> Go over to John 14. John 14, verse 31. Jesus speaking, But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. This is Jesus saying, How do I prove that I love the Father? Because as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Go over to chapter 15. Very next chapter 15. Look at verses 12 to 14. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. And again, if you go back to Ephesians 5.22 and God says to a wife, I command you to submit. When you submit, you're showing your love to him. You're showing your love to God. And so that helps the wife to say, boy, I disagree. This is really hard. And, and ladies, I would say the only limit on this is sin. You don't submit to your husband in sin. So if your husband comes home and says, Honey, we're struggling a little bit here financially. Let's go rob a bank together. I would say, No, I'm not doing that. Um, where it does show up, guys come home and say, Hey, let's watch a, a pornographic movie to help our sex life. You say no to that. Why? Marriage is exclusive. You don't bring anyone into your marriage except your spouse. So your husband says he wants to do that, you say no. Why? That's sin. So you don't submit to your husband in sin. Why? Because in that case you have a higher authority. That's God. But when it's not sin, which again, we all struggle with, right? Because we want to say, it is sin to go to the in-laws again. <laughs> no, that's not sin. All right? That's not sin. So, uh, but if it's sin, then you don't do that. All right, it's a proof of love to God. And then number six, go back to Ephesians 5. It's a picture of the church and Christ. He says in verse 24, Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so that the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So, biblically, if you want to be God's kind of wife, God says you need to submit to your husband. And, again, I'm just... Dealing with an older crowd here, which often you can't have these discussions when kids are in the room. 
But I, do, I do think sex, sex is a problem. It, it, when sex is a problem in your marriage, it's like the red light in your car that says you're out of oil. The problem is not the light. The problem is I don't have oil in the engine. And usually when sex is a problem in my marriage, the problem isn't sex. It's telling me I have another problem. So when, when sex is a problem, I probably have a relationship problem that I need to work on. And I fix that relationship problem, sex will clear up. And so just keep that in mind when you go through this. And, and so when a guy then takes this passage of scripture and says, well, honey, you have to submit. We need to have sex every time I want to have sex. Guys, that's a wrong approach. You do need to have sex on a regular basis. Take your Bible and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. First Corinthians 7, verse 1, the Bible says, Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render his wife the affection due to her. Likewise, also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except it would be consent for a time. You may give yourselves a fasting and prayer and come together again. So Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I will say, if you're having a pornography problem, it's like supercharging your engine. So if, if you have a unusual, crazy sex drive, one of the things is, is there any pornography involved? Because that's a problem. And if we have pornography out of the picture, the Bible is very clear that each of your bodies is the other person's. And I've done enough marriage counseling where it's not always the guy that wants more sex. Sometimes it's the wife that wants more sex. And it would, however it falls in your marriage, you two want to work together on that. To, the goal of sex is to give, not to get. When, and the problem we often get in marriage is we use sex to get. It's what I want. Instead, no, sex is about giving. And that's why you do the 50 questions. It'll add five questions on intimacy. What touches does she like? What touches does she not like? What tur turns her on sexually? What turns her off sexually? You need to know what those things are. Dwell with her according to knowledge. And when you say, you know, your body is mine, quoting the scripture verse, you know, then the wife says, well, yeah, your body's mine, and I'm telling your body no. You know? <laughs> it goes both ways here, right? But ladies, if a guy comes and says, hey, honey, let's have sex. The guys that already talked about, don't just jump to sex. Should be holding hands, hugging, kissing, all the, you know, romance. But guys, sometimes she is exhausted. She's too tired. What you need to do then is say, I really, I can't tonight, but I will try to be ready tomorrow night. And then ladies make a really good effort to be ready the next night. And in a good and healthy marriage, you can have those discussions. And if you are a loving husband, what are you going to say to that? Okay. You know what a lot of husbands, they get Mr. Grumpy Pants. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> they just give the cold shoulder, face the wall. Okay. Okay. That's not what a loving husband does. A loving husband says, okay, honey. Hey, you, got, you had a long day. It's okay. Hey, we'll try to do this tomorrow. But really work on it. And so submission and, and, and sex in a marriage is important. In fact, as it says at the end of this passage, if you don't, let Satan tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Satan will try to take an advantage in this area. And I'm always crystal clear. There's no excuse for adultery. None. On either side. But I would tell you, if I, if I go to a great steak place, I have a steak, baked potato, salad, and they come at the very end and they say, would you like dessert? I, if I'm at a good steak place, 100%, I love steak, by the way. I am a meat eater. I'm hoping not finding any vegetarians in the room. But I mean, I love steak. And so I finish a great meal and they say, would you like dessert? If I'm at a good steak place, it is always no. Why? I am stuffed. And when your marriage is healthy, a dessert can walk by and not a big deal. I'm satisfied at home. I'm full. But when you're starving, you'll eat out of a garbage can. And this is God's point in this area. That you need to have relationships on a regular enough basis that you're both satisfied. And probably you're both not on the same page there, so you've got to find the middle ground. 
And that's what marriage is. It's finding that middle ground. But it's wrong to take this passage and say, wife, you have to submit. You have to have sex every time I want to have sex. It is right to say we need to have sex on a regular basis. God is clear. And it's a wonderful thing in marriage. And the fire in the fireplace is great. Forest fire is terrible, right? And so keep it hot in your marriage. And keep it uh, in a pace that works for both of you. Uh, but be gracious and kind in this area. But should a wife desire to have sex with her husband, you should. Uh, but if there's issues going on, again, that's the red light telling you there's another relationship problem. So let's work on a relationship problem and let's talk about it. And I, I would just say to you, you're married. You should have these talks with each other. I've worked with a lot of couples that they don't talk about this area of the marriage. It's not going to get better if you don't talk about it. And, and you might talk about it and you might be a little crabby a day or two because it was like a hard conversation. But it will get better and you'll be glad long term that you talked about it. Um, Let's go on to number two. A fitting helper. So a wife is, her first role is submission. Secondly, a fitting helper. Genesis 2.28, when God made a wife, he made her a completer. So you must decide, ladies, if you want to be the president, a completer, or just a housewife. Which is the right one in that list? It's the completer. No one can contribute as you can. I was a college and career pastor for a long time. I go to single guys' homes, you can tell they are single guys. You know what I'm talking about? Single guys do not care about blinds. They do not care about towels. Uh, I've, I've walked in and seen an engine in the living room before. <laughs> and, uh, I'm like, dude, you need a wife. <laughs> I mean, we, women bring something to a home that guys just don't think about. I mean, I don't know about your home, but I have really nice towels that I never can use. <laughs> I'm like, honey, why do we have these really nice? Those are for our guests. <laughs> Only the guests have the really nice towels. Oh, okay. I have more than two pillows on my bed. I only use one pillow. She only uses one pillow. Why do we need 20 pillows on our bed? <laughs> I have, I still don't know the answer to that. <laughs> but if she wants 20 pillows on the bed, we'll have 20 pillows on the bed. I get my exercise out by running. I take the pillows off, right? I put it back on. And I would just say, it's a wonderful thing. Women bring something to your life that you will miss. And it's okay. And God does call some men to be single. And that's okay. But the Bible says that a wife is a help me. She is a completer. Uh, the Bible says it is not good for a man to be alone. Now you can have a good friend, but primarily God wants that to be a wife. <coughs> you contribute to him emotionally, physically, attitudes, domestically, a friend. You're a picture of Christ in the church. By the way, uh, you should be your husband's best friend and best source of counsel. And I would say that if she's gonna be a completer, guys, you've gotta let her do that. She will complete, she'll see things you don't see. So when you make a big decision and you didn't run it by her, that was a big mistake. Mm -hmm. You need to, she's your completer. That's the way God meant it. So you got a big decision, run it by her. Say, hey, what do you think? Man, I'm kind of working through this. Let her be the completer that God meant her to be. And because we're running out of time, number three, reverence, not revamp your husband. Go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5, we look at verses 22 to 24. Let's skip down to verse 33. The Bible says, Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Ladies, if I could help you, this is going to be a key. Most guys are not, <laughs> guys do not share their feelings. You ask a guy how he feels, he'll tell you how he thinks. In fact, if two guys are together, we talk about our feelings, we both think that was weird. All right, that was like a full of cup. Women talk about their feelings. You guys talk about how we think. And so it's hard to get to a guy's feelings, but ro romance is to a woman. A woman who gets married does not want to be unromance. She wants to be romance the rest of her life. A husband wants to be respected the rest of his life. Ladies, if you forget anything I say tonight, the most attractive thing a married guy finds in his wife is appreciation. 
is respect. And think of it as a bank account. If you're always making withdrawals, you're always taking money out, you're bankrupting. And if all you're doing is complaining, you're always telling him everything he does wrong, all you're, you're always putting him down, you're bankrupting your marriage. And God says, I didn't put this in the Bible, God says you are to respect your husband. In fact, uh, this Greek word, which is going to really tick some of you off, uh, the Greek word on this, which I have here, it means respect, regards, notices, honors, prefers, esteems, praises, loves, admires exceedingly. It's the, he's my man kind of attitude. They did a survey of 100 men, and they said, would you rather be loved and disrespected or respected and unloved? 98% of those men said, I'd rather be respected and unloved. They did the same survey to women. Would you rather be loved and disrespected or respected and loved? 90% of women said, I'd rather be loved. Respect is to a man what romance is to a woman. And ladies, if you can just think how much you want to be romanced, that's how much your husband wants to be respected. And that's why if you put him down in public, you did one of the worst things you could do to him. If you put him down in front of the kids, you're killing him. Your kids will often have the view of your husband, of, of your view of your husband. And if your kids think he's great, it's probably because you think he's great. I said this on Sunday. He can go put us, you know, he's put in the back deck and he puts the first post in. Hey, honey, come look. And he walk out and go, it's a post in the ground. Good job. What he wants you to say is, you did that? Wow. That is amazing. I don't know any guy that can put a post in the ground like that. that is, man, I'm so glad you're mine. That is incredible. So having my wife hurt that, my wife will come up to me. You did that? <laughs> <laughs> what happens, ladies, if you don't respect your husband? By the way, this is what happens to you, biblically. Resentment. By the way, you just think this through. If you don't respect your husband today, resentment, bitterness, tension, destruction of love, discouragement, depression, and you're hindering God's work through you. You're not to be your husband's personalized Holy Spirit. You are to express thankfulness. When's the last time you told him what you appreciated about him? Honey, thanks for working so hard. Thanks for helping out at the home. Thanks for fixing that thing. You know how many times a guy fixes something and you never say anything about it? But you sure mention all the other things that aren't done? That's discouraging. Let me also say this. When a guy's working on his marriage, he's really trying. And I said this, on, I think I said this on Sunday. I've worked with enough couples, it's weird what take people off. I've had some husbands lose their mind because their wife fold, washed the clothes, folded the clothes, but didn't put them in the dresser. And I'm like, seriously, that's what you get ticked off about? I've had some wives lose their mind because she'll take the plate and put it in the sink, but not in the dishwasher. And she's like, they're right next to each other. Like, seriously, you take it all the way over there and you just put it in the sink? Like, the dishwasher is right there. Or he shoots it off the rim, right? It, it didn't speak it in the clothes basket. It's just super close. And she's like, I am not your mother. Pick up your clothes and get him in the hamper. He's like, honey, you should have seen it. It went off the rim. It went like so, <laughs> so then he works on it. I mean, I mean, weeks go by and it's all in the hamper. And, and three weeks later, again, he misses off and he leaves it there. And you come in and you make this statement. You don't care. You're not even trying. By the way, what does that do to the guy? Well, then I'm not going to try. Because I've been trying for three weeks, and for three weeks I made it all in the hand. And you just wiped out all my hard work by telling me that I wasn't doing anything. And be careful. And you got to say respect is important. Be joyful in spite of emotions. PMS and menopause are not a reason to rip his head off. <laughs> and so you get, that's hard, right? And those are real things. And you're going to have to fight against that when you feel that way. Praise him when he does well and encourage him when he fails. When he fails, remind him that he's not a failure. And he needs to hear that from you. In fact, when I often do a wedding, I'll remind the, the bride of this. 
Though others turn their back against him, though everyone else says he's not worth anything, you need to be the one standing there saying, I still believe in you. And there's a big difference between failing and being a failure. And he's going to mess up. He's not going to get it always right. And you need to come alongside of him and say, hey, that's too bad it didn't work out that way, but it's going to be okay. You are his encouragement. You are there to be respectful. That's the idea of respect. Regard, notice, honors, prefers. And I've got some of them go, you've got to be kidding me. Like, why do I got to be his cheerleader? Why do I got to do that? Because it matters to him. And again, like I said earlier, if the whole world thinks I'm junk and Joan thinks I'm great, I'm good. But when she thinks I'm garbage, everyone else could say I'm the greatest guy in the world. That feels gross. And ladies, there's a tendency, why does God put this in the Bible? It's a, it's a weak point for wives, right? Why does he say to husbands, love your wife, learn about her, and lead her? Weak point for men. Why does he come to wives and say, be a completer, uh, submit, and respect? It's the weak point for wives. What does that tell you? Why is the tendency is to hound on his weaknesses, to not be good at respect, to not be good at praise. And ladies, God's, I didn't put this in the Bible, as he says in the end of verse 33. Nevertheless, each one of you in particular, love his own wife as himself, and with the wife, see that she respect her husband. Let me give you some important things to remember as we finish. Number one, God has a plan and God's plan works. Number two, love him as he is. Number three, remember that you chose him. <laughs> Number four, deal with your own lot first. Number five, give your rights to God. And number six, respond biblically and in love. And ladies, I would just encourage you. How many Hallmark cards say, I respect you? Almost none. All the Hallmark cards, you go to Father's Day, pick the day. But you know what a husband wants? He wants respect. And he's messed up. He's made mistakes. Just like he has to love you and put those positive things in the front, negative things in the back, as you respect him, you've got to put his positive things in front, put his negative things in the back. When I was a youth pastor, when I had a team that was a problem, I would look for something that I could praise him for. And sometimes it took a long time. I had some bad teenagers. But the minute I found something I could praise him for, man, I was all over it. I'm taking him a pizza. I'm showing up at his school. And I mean, I went into a public school, and you know, in the public school, they don't even know what a youth pastor is, right? I showed up with a pizza. What are all those other kids like? What did you do to get a pizza? I don't know. I'm like, hey, when you didn't beat that kid up on Sunday, you actually paid attention. <laughs> I've been looking for that for three months. <laughs> and I wanted to bring pizza to let you know I noticed. What does that team do? What's that team like next Sunday? Respect matters. And ladies, you'll find that if you start respecting your husband, it will do something for him that you will, it will shock you. You're like, I had no idea that mattered so much to him. And if you're always withdrawing, if you're always complaining, you're always riding him, instead of saying, man, honey, let me talk about all the great things. I'm so thankful for you. I love you. You're awesome. And that's what he's looking for. And God says this is a role that God has for you covered a lot of ground tonight. Let's go and pray over this one. Heavenly Father, I thank you for all the couples in this room. I pray you help us to have strong, healthy marriages. Lord, we know Satan hates that. He's attacking our marriages all the time. And God, I pray, as we've covered a lot of stuff tonight, if a husband's here and he got convicted on something, help him to work on it. Help him not to be discouraged tonight. God, help him to maybe write a love letter to his wife this week. Maybe be specific of all the things he actually loves about her. Maybe there's a wife here tonight that's like, man, it's been a long time since I've just praised my husband and just told him how awesome I really think he is. But God, help the wives to, to work on these areas. And God, as we work together, help us to have great marriages that not only honor you, but are a great joy to us as we go through life. So how do you design marriage to be a tremendous blessing? I pray that we would experience that and enjoy that as we go through life together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. Have a great night.